All right, we've talked about when care is delayed and what to do in that situation, especially with splinting and getting the person out to care. But what happens if you can't get out in a day? Maybe it's gonna take multiple days to get out. How do you protect yourself against the elements and the victim so that you can make it to the next day or maybe several days so that you can eventually find help or help can find you? And that's what this chapter is about. So it's not a survival class, but I do want to give you the basics. We have to cover some really basic terms in wilderness survival, and then we're going to combine them with some of the first aid knowledge we've already talked about in other lessons. So there's the rule of threes. So if you find yourself, maybe somebody gets injured, y'all can't hike out, maybe it's at the end of the day, starting to rain, what have you, and you know you can't get out, and you're gonna to have to stay in that location, what's your first priority? And that's shelter. And the reason we go shelter over fire is because if it comes a downpour and we have a fire, it's gonna put that fire out and we're gonna be soaking wet. But if we have shelter, then we can focus on fire. So shelter comes first. It doesn't even have to be anything we build. It could be a cliff, a cave, what have you. A huge tree that's leaned over that protects us against rain that's what we're looking for something we we don't have to build hopefully because that takes a lot of time and energy so once we have shelter established then we can focus on fire the fire not only is going to give us additional warmth but it would allow us to boil water which will help us treat the water so that we don't get sick from it and it keeps predators at bay. You know, it just makes you feel a lot better if you have a fire out in the wilderness. And if somebody is hypothermic, it'll help us get them warm and we can dry out our clothes. You know, it just, uh, there's a lot of benefits. So shelter and fire, we put those together and we think about those in the first three hours. Shelter first, once we have shelter established, then we start focusing on how to make fire. Now water, we can go up to three days without, depending on the environment. So if it's a humid environment, we're gonna sweat a bunch, so we lose a lot of water that way. If it's a dry environment, we're gonna sweat a bunch, but it's gonna evaporate, and we'll lose water that way. But roughly, rough idea, about three days. And you're gonna be hurting by the third day. So water is extremely important. But for this class, Again, not a wilderness survival class, so we're not going to focus on food. This is a situation where you just can't get back out within a day, and you're going to have to stay overnight, and you need to be able to get yourself and the victim through the night as comfortably as possible. So we're going to focus on shelter, fire, and water. There's a bunch of different types of shelters. I'm not going through all of these. You can look these up if you're interested in this topic. That's the only reason I put them in here. But the most basic, if you had to build one, it's best not to. I mean, it's best to use the environment. So if you have a cave, an overhang, a huge tree, ready-made shelters are the best way to go. And may require a little bit of work, but hopefully it's something where you don't have to put a lot of effort into. And it, protects, it should protect you from rain, driving rain, and the wind. Those are the two main things that we're looking for and that we can get ourselves up off the ground. A lean-to is another easy way to build a shelter. And if you're gonna be there for more than a day or two, it's something that can be added onto and made into an A-frame. So that's another one. But again, I'm not going through all of these but a simple lean-to, you just take a ridge pole, stick it between two trees so that it's level, build one wall on one side that's a 45 degree angle. That'll help shed the water. You need to have about two to three feet of brush so that it will shed the water and protect you against the wind. And if you had to stay there more than another day, the next day you could add another wall to it and then it becomes an A-frame. So a real simple, quick lean-to will allow two people to get in it. A debris hut is really more than nothing more than just a big nest. It's not gonna provide a whole lot of protection. It's more for insulation. A lean tube would be the way to go, especially with multiple people. And there are ways to build lean tubes 
without ridge poles or an A-frame really so that it's portable and you can use the wall like a gurney but anyway different class lean to would be the way to go if you had more than one person because you can add on to it primitive fire so I've listed a bunch here the big three would be the fire roll hand drill and bow drill I normally teach a fire roll first most people don't know a lot about it you can look up videos on this if you want to see how it's done it's a pretty easy method it can you can use natural resources to do it but it is not as reliable as the bow drill the bow drill is probably the most reliable friction primitive fire that you'll ever make the problem with it is it has four moving parts as opposed to two with the fire roll and it takes some technique so the Egyptian bow drill is the best. But again, if you had no matches, no striker, and you had to make a fire, and you knew how to do a bow drill, I would go with that. You can use a fire roll, but it's the weakness in that one is the fibers that hold everything together can be hard to find because they had to be just right. Cotton works really good, so if you had a first aid kit, cotton works perfectly. But again, I can't really describe how to do it. I'd have to show you. So I will, uh, in my face-to-face -face classes, I teach them how to do it because I can teach anybody how to do a fire roll. And it's quick and easy to teach a large class. Bow drill takes a lot more time to teach. So watch this video, answer the questions that are on the lecture notes. Now let's talk about water. How do, you, how do you purify water if you don't have a fire? So we're worried about amoebas, bacteria, viruses, heavy metals, and pesticides. But for the short term, we don't want to get sick and get diarrhea from drinking bad water or vomit because then we'll get dehydrated and we'll get weak. And So a sip well, or some people call it seep wells, that's why I put both of them on there. It's a way that you can dig a hole with porous ground and the ground itself will filter the water and at least get amoebas out of it. You need to be a, about three feet from your water source. You dig down, water fills up inside the well. You can sip that out. It does not get rid of bacteria. It doesn't get rid of viruses. It doesn't get rid of heavy metals or pesticides charcoal filter is the same so if you had access to a fire or maybe you were on a beach where charcoal washes up a lot you can crush that charcoal up and use it to filter water again no different than a seep well in that you're only getting rid of amoebas and you have to do it right boiling water would probably be the easiest and the one that gets rid of a lot of pathogens so all you need is a container, or you can dig a hole, line it with clay, something that's not going to let the water just seep out, and boil the water with um, hot rocks. So you heat the rocks up around your fire, boil the water that way. If you have a container, that's easy. Put it in the container, boil the water in that. So that gets rid of amoebas, gets rid of bacteria viruses but it does not get rid of heavy metals or pesticides the only way to do that is to distill water and that's more complicated there are a lot of different primitive ways to distill water you can do it with clay clay sources it can be done but it's difficult if you can find two bottles aluminum or glass you can use those to distill water as well so you're just collecting the steam and one from one container to the next making sure the contaminated water doesn't splash over into the other one. So distillation would be the gold standard. The only problem with that is you get rid of everything, even your electrolytes. So you may want to, if you have access to salt, like on a beach, you can put a little bit of salt water back into it so that you're not losing all electrolytes. Food, in short-term survival, don't worry about it, right? You, the average American has about three weeks of energy in fat stores, some of us more than others. So um, we have plenty. You may get weak, but you have enough to get you through. This is not about long-term survival, so that's where food becomes extremely important. We're talking about care being delayed. Somebody's getting injured. We have to stay overnight. 
How do we get them through the night? We're not worried about food right now. The only time that would be extremely important is if somebody's having a diabetic emergency. Injuries, so splinting, these are common to like wilderness first aid. So you notice we'll, we focus on splinting, that's a big one, somebody gets injured, we have to splint, carry them out, so it may take us several days to get them out because now they're not as mobile as they were before. So we may have to make a gurney to drag them out. There's a lot of different things that go into that. Controlling bleeding is a big one. So we have to get the bleeding shut down. This is where tourniquets become extremely important. If a pressure bandage isn't working, you may have to put a tourniquet on. The problem is, if it takes us several days to get out, that limb below the tourniquet is going to die. The tissue is going to die. And that's just something that the person has to be aware of. But if you don't apply it and a pressure bandage can't control the bleeding, they'll die if they lose too much blood. So impelled objects are big during wilderness first aid, hypothermia, hyperthermia. We talked about those in previous slides. You can go back to the last chapter. Bites and stings is something we haven't talked too much about, so I'll talk a little bit about it in here. But this chapter is really just to give you a rough idea of what to focus on. We don't spend a lot of time on CPR or AEDs because you can't do CPR for two days or a day and then, you know, if care is going to be delayed, CPR is not a very useful skill unless somebody can get to you or you can get that person out relatively fast. Same thing with an AED. We're not going to have access to an AED out in the wild. So splinting. we got to stabilize the injury. We do that to prevent further injury, and we're doing it because we're going to move the victim. These are going to be really general because we've covered these in other chapters. Bleeding. We're really worried about arterial bleeding. It's the most difficult to control. One quart for an adult can lead to shock. One pint for a child can lead to shock. So we've got to shut down that bleeding. Pressure bandage doesn't work. We have to, may have to improvise a tourniquet. Snake bites, something we haven't talked about. Now I'm talking about pit vipers here. So this is care is going to be delayed, so 911 can't get to you, but if you can call them, call 911. Carry the person as if possible, this is where like a gurney style would come into play, especially if they hurt their or they got bit on the leg, which is where most people get bit. Walk them out slowly. The problem is, if it's going to be a long distance, if you can carry, try to carry them to limit the amount of time that venom is circulated around. So don't apply a pressure bandage to a pit viper. It does more damage to that area. It localizes the venom just in that area, and it'll do extreme damage to the tissue. Do not suck out the wound. One reason for infection, but if you have an open wound, you could envenomate yourself as well. And don't apply a pressure bandage. It may do more harm than good because of most of your pit vipers have hematoxic venom or a blend of hematoxic with neuro neurotoxic venom. So the hematoxin will just destroy tissue, and you may have to treat them for anaphylactic shock. So this is just to give you a rough idea about the big, broad, general things you need to think about for wilderness, wilderness first aid. How do you get yourself through the night so you can get out the next day? Or at least get through the night so somebody can come looking for you if you think somebody's going to come searching for you. So shelter fire, water, extremely important in those situations. And then how do you care for a victim? What gets priority? You know, if you've got one person that has damaged their ankle and the other person is bleeding, we got to control the bleeding first. We can deal with that ankle later. So prioritizing what's important. Making sure if you have multiple victims that you understand who gets care first.